G'day team, welcome to the Feel Good Blueprint and to episode 9 of Isolation Intellect Interviews. I'm your host Simon Ma, and I created the Feel Good Blueprint to bring together a community of like-minded people to share ideas, tools and resources to help others find their great. I'm super grateful for you tuning into this episode and if you like what you see or hear, if you could please consider subscribing or sharing with at least one friend, it would be incredible. My next guest is Mr Lucius Boric, considered one of Australia's best drummers of all time. He grew up with huge musical influence from his mother and his father, rock and blues legend Kevin Boric. He picked up the drumsticks by the age of three and was learning from and jamming with some of the most talented rock artists from Australia and around the world. He played his first live show at the age of 13. Following his intuition, purpose and passion for drumming, Lucius was able to cut his own path, playing for a number of celebrated bands like Juice and Cog. He started to make some great records and tour around the world. In this episode, the first of two parts, Lucius and I discuss his formative years, what it was like growing up and developing his craft, how the pandemic has affected him, musicians around him and the live music scene, his new studios in Byron Bay, 101 Studios, and any live music we might expect from him from his bands Cog and Juice. These funky intro tunes that you hear are courtesy of Cog and Lucius's permission, so thank you so much for allowing me to play. Enjoy. I'd like to thank Lucius for coming on the show. I wanted to get him on because he's a big inspiration for me and many others, and I know he will be for you as well. He leads with the heart, and he leads with service through his music, which I think is so admirable. So thanks for coming on, Lucius, and I hope everyone enjoys this interview. Thanks for having me, Simon. Thanks a lot. It's, um, I'm really excited to speak to you today. Uh, you know, I've been uh, a big fan of, of, of the group Cog, one of the, the main bands, I suppose, of notoriety you've, you've played for, amongst many others, which we'll get into. But um, I'd love to start with just a bit about you and your background. Yeah, sure. Um, this background here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beautiful one at that. It's not CGI. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, you know, I guess my, my, my musical background, obviously that's what you're referring to, um, was very, very rich in music. I, I started off very young, um, around three, age of three, I think. I started to kind of play the drums or find some interest in playing the drums. Um, there was always, you know, um, a lots and lots of, musicians around the house at the time my mother and father were together um and so it had that vibe you know and it had that real that real nice um eclectic creative uh, musical thing that was going on and you know music was a big part of it so i think as a child i just kind of gravitated towards that quite naturally given the environment um and I think it was probably fun too for some of my father's, you know, friends who were drummers to kind of, uh, they actually, you know, built me a, a small drum kit when I was younger. Um, and I was able to play that uh, simple 4-4 time apparently, um, which was, you know, which I guess set me on some type of a path. I've still got some photos. Apparently there was, there was some tapes, like old tapes as well, but they got, they got um, either trashed or, or they just got misplaced unfortunately but um, I could play 4-4 four, four time at around the age of three and uh, yeah I was just um, I think they just set me off on some type of a path really and my um, my mother who pretty much um, you know she she was really instrumental as well in, in type in terms of like opening that space up for me to be very um, creative with music. Um, however, I did it in, in any situation that we we're in because after my mother and father split up, my father, you know, kind of did the typical cliche sex, drugs and rock and roll. And, and you know, it was just left with me and my mother and, and my sister. And, you know, wherever we were living at the time, I would kind of utilize whatever I had um, to just try and bring in music in whatever way. Um, and it was really, um, interesting cause I didn't have a drum kit. So I would try different, different things, you know, I'd try different experiments in trying to create drum kits and, and, um, that was a, a really kind of interesting thing because mum would walk into the room and she'd see like my mattress off the bed. I'd be sitting on the edge of the bed with the, the kit wrapped around me and I'd get a pen and like draw Tom Toms on the on the you know the side of the of the the mattress i'd put a cardboard box down and i'd kind of have the height 
of the mattress just because where it was in the, the cardboard box was a snare and the kick drum sounded pretty good on the on the floor because um, you know we were living in an apartment so I had that bottom end sound so I could actually kind of play without having a drum kit there was those type of things there was different types of other ways of um, creating you know drum kits and things like that and I actually ended up um, finally getting a drum kit and it sat in the lounge room I, th I think my, my poor mum was um, she just I, I just needed to set this drum kit up it was and it was in a flat it was in, a, in, a, in an apartment I obviously couldn't play it but I could set it up and I set it up right in the lounge room <laughs> between the couch and the television and <laughs> it was only a small a small space but it had this big this big Tama drum kit which was my first drum kit and I didn't play it but I just looked at it <laughs> and uh, I'd sit down behind it and we'd put music on and I'd pretend to play it you know I'd pretend to hit where where the obviously where the toms were and everything and and it was a lot of air drumming but the drum kit was there but I couldn't touch it so there was this real for a long period of time there was this yearning for actually really wanting to hit the drums and really having a place to hit the drums and it was it was just I remember it was just such a quest to try and find places that where maybe there was a drum kit that I could hit or you know at someone's house or at school or or somewhere you know it's just I, but I could never really get to that real space where I had my real drum kit and I could really play it as loud as I want and no one would disturb me and and that took years. It took like it took a long, long time. And um, I, f I finally remember one of the times of um, my real development in terms of like where I really started to practice and really started to hone things was my because my father and mother were separated. But I I um, would go off to my father's house and he he. Um, he had a garage out the back, basically, that was converted into a bit of a studio. So he allowed me to have a drum kit in there and, and, and I could come and kind of go from that place um, and practice my drums. And, I, and I, I pretty much did that for a good three years, I think. Um, was that like your, more, the, more the formative years? Like, was this sort of when you were in your teens, your early teens? Yeah, it was around the, yeah, like the 12... 13 14 mark i think because I, I, I was kind of i was having a bit of bit of a battle at, at school um i wasn't very good at school i left school at year nine in year nine i knew what i wanted to do there was never a doubt in my mind that i i, I was going to do anything else other than play drums so school was was really challenging and it's not like i, I didn't like school but i, I just found it like I like my sport and I really like you know the woodwork and the metal work but anything to do with mathematics or you know anything English or the spelling any of that stuff was just because it was such a turbulent time in my youth with my my parents and the the the, the, the relationship that broke down there and the moving and the you know at this school and that school and then that school and no school and then home school and then it was just it was quite um you know it was quite a whirlwind so i didn't really have a good solid grounding in a curriculum that was that was quite based in any um um continuity you know so it was really frustrating because they're your formative year your very important mm. years you know those those years of say you know between like five and ten of learning you know like i was just moved around everywhere yeah um and as I said, it was a pretty turbulent time. So, was there like um, a was there like a certain certainty you had? Was there a moment in time where you were just like, "Yeah, this is me drumming. Like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life." Basically, yeah, I I, I knew that, but I knew I just had to to kind of get to that finish line to start that process. And um, I like when I was going over to my father's place, and I, I would I'd go out the back and I'd. Re practice for hours like three four five hours at a time and this was a good solid you know between the ages of um say 12 to 15 i think off and on um at that time i was i was um also 
I got the opportunity to to be in a in a show in a in a television show, which was completely out of left field, and I auditioned for it. It was a thing called it was a, a, like a mainstream Channel Nine prime time seven o'clock at night television show, um, and it went for I think it went for an hour or half an hour or something like that. And I my my um, my uncle, I think he helped write the theme song for the for the um, for the show called Willing and Able. And they were looking for like a street kid to play the part, young street kid, kind of a bit of a hooligan type of a thing, and. Um, I, you know, they, they asked me, my uncle said, look, there's this thing going on. Do you, do you want to have a, do you want to have a look at it? Do you want to try out? And I was, it's kind of like, not really, but I kind of got pushed into it, but I thought it would be fun. And I didn't think I'd get it anyway. So I, I, I just went along and apparently they auditioned, you know, anywhere up to 5,000 kids and, you know, girls and boys. And so I went along and, um, had a bit of a laugh and, the phone rung in a, in a couple of days time and said, you got, the part, I've got the part. And I was just like, and I was like, well, I actually broke down crying. I was, I was shocked because I knew I was going to have to kind of like spell and, and remember lines and read. And I was ter terrible at reading and, you know, let alone trying to remember a whole bunch of lines. So all of a sudden this, this, you know, feeling came over me of like, Oh my God, you know, this is, what am I getting, what would I get locked into here that I, I don't really want to, but, and then everyone in the family's going, this will be great for you and uh, good for you, you know, um, you know, there'll be some money there and, you know, could point you in another direction in terms of like what you want to do with your life and everything. So I kind of, you know, bit the bullet and I went with it and I did it for a year and, and you know, that was around year eight, I think, year, year eight, year nine, and you know, I was 14 or so. So I was doing this television show for like a year pretty much. And that, you know, I was missing school. There was supposed to be a, a school tutor on the, on the, um, the set who was actually a drummer, I think funnily <laughs> enough. <laughs> so I think I used to ask him, you know, bits and pieces of, of, you know, drumming, drumming things and whatnot. But, um, yeah, it was an interesting time because all of a sudden I was doing some acting stuff and, and, and it was just really, really strange to me. But at the same time, it was just like, as soon as there started to be a, a bit of a bank account come in uh, with, with some money flow, I knew that was the ticket to get the drum kit. I knew that was one of the tickets to get the drum kit. So it was like, okay. And also I could buy my, you know, my friend's surfboards and some shoes and skateboards and we'd go and, you know, quit school and eat fish and chips and I'd buy them all, you know, it was just, it was great. It was in that, in that way, it was really good. So I had a little bit of, you know, a little bit of flow, which money flow, which was, which is good. Nothing, nothing too major, but you know, when you're 13, 14, you know, it was, it was, it was nice to have a little bit of that. So I bought a drum kit. I think they even wrote like, well, they did, they, they, they wrote, one episode around music, which I actually played drums in the episode. Um, I can't remember what it was. I think it was all up, you know, there was, there was quite a few episodes, but, um, you know, that ran its course. And then after that, trying to go back to school, trying to get into that world again, after kind of coming and going and, and knowing what I wanted to do musically and really practicing my drums and, you know, it was, it was just a very, very strange time in some respects because it wasn't normal. Like my friends had some kind of normality, you know, five days a week going to school and, and all that stuff. So I was a bit out of the loop with the friends and the groups and all that type of thing, kind of, you know, a little bit doing my own thing, but I was happy with that. And, and I'd be practicing when I wasn't doing the, the acting thing. And anyway, that, that came to, obviously came to an end, like I said. So when I went back to school, I just could, I couldn't cope um, going back there. And I think I just made that decision at that time to, to leave school. And I asked my mother and I asked my, my father um, and they weren't too happy with that. Well, I know my father wasn't happy, but you know, my mother, I don't think she was too happy, but she knew that, you know, she trusted me to do the right thing and, and, and get, you know, do what I wanted to do, which was to play music. And I was, 
when I made that decision and I, I turned my back on the school and I walked away, it was um, an incredible feeling. I'll never forget that feeling of, of walking away from the school and my back to the school and walking off. Um, it's like a, this massive monkey just lifted off my back not knowing I was, I was, you know, about to enter <laughs> a massive <laughs> yeah. life monkey that was about to hop on. But, <laughs> um, but just, I uh, just remember that feeling of, of this, this, you know, this kind of so-called freedom, if you will, that came over me. And, um, I thought, wow, okay, now I can really go for what I really want to do, which is to play, to play music and play my drums. Like I've just mm. done that show. I've saved up. I've bought a, bought a drum kit. I've got my cymbals. I've been practicing. I've been jamming with some friends here and there. Um, and then I got, because my, my father was, was, was quite, um, you know, in the music industry, my, my uncle and my father, both, you know, quite um, well-known musicians. Um, I'd done a little bit of touring uh, with my father. He actually helped me um, play a couple of shows, which was, which was kind of good for my confidence um, getting on stage. Um, it was funny in some respects because I knew that the, you know, when I played with my father, he was like, well, you have to have a drum solo. So being all of, you know, 13, 14 and not too confident in doing drum solos, like the spotlights on you now, and yeah. it's time for a drum solo. <laughs> that was intimidating. That was really intimidating, but I knew what I thought would, would, would work was, would, um, was to have two bass drums <laughs> so I could do these big triplets and bass drums and that would fool fool a lot of people it'd, it'd sound great because it's a simple kind yeah. of exercise but once it's done kind of kind of fast in a you know in a way that's um you know that it's meant is that like to be a double played. kick is that I mean, yeah, like, I mean, like, like a, a double kick yeah it's like a triplet thing with the double kicks and you know it sounds great you know it sounds really good so I thought well that'll fool them and that'll that'll get me through the the drum solo which, yeah. so i kind of use that um which kind of really propelled me to try and work on drum solos without having double kicks obviously which is where i went <laughs> but um because i didn't want to have to rely on that but um anyway it, it um i left i left school and from that time on i was kind of moving out of home too so i was moving with different friends and and you know i'd move in with like um, my friend's mum and, and their kids and they were separated from their father and so I'd have a, a, a room off to the side and I was, I was I was a bit of a you know young nomad really in some respects and then I'd you know I'd go and go and visit my mum and stay with her or you know maybe sleep up my dad's a night or I just I was just you know very kind of um, uh, free in a sense to to kind of move in that in that regard try and find my place if you will um, I ended up which was really cool. I ended up getting a, a gig with my first proper pro professional gig, paying gig really early on. So I didn't just leave school and then have nothing for a long period of time. I really wanted to work. I really wanted to start playing. And I got the opportunity to play a show in a Rolling Stones cover band called the Rolling Clones. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, had some, you know, some good players in it and, and notably, um, Mark Evans from ACDC, the original bass player. So my first band really was with, was a cover band, a, a Rolling Stones cover band, but um, wow. it had some great players in it, like Mark yeah. Evans and, and Mick, Mick Cox from Rose Tattoo, the, the guitarist. Um, so I was all of like 14, 15, and I picked up this gig, and I worked in that band for probably, I think it was two years almost. So it was, you know, it was like a good solid three or four nights a week and some touring in New Zealand and... And it was, you know, it was really, really good. Great for my playing. And it was all live environments, different places, um, which was which was really great for my playing. I mean, I liked, you know, obviously Charlie Watts is the drummer of the Rolling Stones. And, and I didn't really appreciate him at the time because I was kind of young and I was into a bit more of the, you know, the chop heavy guys, you know, yeah. like the, you know, Billy Cobham and, and um, Vinnie Colliuta and, and, um, a bunch of other guys like that so there i was trying to play you know rolling stones music but you know if i feel if it was my time for a fill it wouldn't be the simple great charlie watts fill it would be some kind of vinnie collie you to rip yeah. off fill <laughs> like, everyone turn around and go like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and, and that's interesting because you, that that was definitive in your style because you know rewinding back to when you were, you were banging on all kinds of different things as a kid all the way through and yeah, that's all influencing your style you had your, your father was a rock and blues legend and all the the guys around you and around him that were creating this unique persona and this unique style for you and um it's really interesting because you know as as what we hear today all the different styles you play what what was what was the journey from sort of where you were then all the way through through to now has that sort of changed for you yeah so jumping out of that band when that that came to an end i kind of went in in, a, in, a, in another another um another kind of weird situation you know and i, I mentioned the, the television show situation well it went down another path like that again which was really strange is you know and it, i, I kind of link it to my uncle again because he he's been on you know in theater shows and stuff for a long he's done some of the big ones like jesus christ superstar and you know some of these things so um he got this part in the buddy holly theater show and they were auditioning auditioning drummers so i got the call from you know my my auntie um, my mum's sister and said look they're auditioning why don't why don't you go for it you know like how you know see what can happen and and i thought well yeah it's kind of it's theater it's acting it was a little bit you know down that avenue and i was like live theater you know like that's pretty that's pretty intense you know but i didn't have any work the rolling stones thing had kind of run its course i was getting little gigs here and there and, and playing around but this was was going to be like solid work for like another well it looked like a year or something like that so that was the, the show it was made you know like big big show theaters basically biggest you can get in australia really uh, i went along and i got the part and i not only got the part to to play in the big band for the buddy holly big band but also got the understudy part as one of the crickets so that was really interesting because then all of a sudden i was, I was starting to you know do some acting live on stage and play drums at the same time um when the the main guy um tony i think his name was yeah who, who was the the main um actor for for one of the crickets the, the drummer he um when he'd go off and do his holidays or if he was sick or anything like that i'd jump in and take that part so um but that was my introduction into falling in love with like 50s music and, and and drumming for for that style of um you know that time you know which was and we opened the show in melbourne we were there for six months and then we toured around australia so i was kind of like um you know it was great because it was another level again you know i was i think i was i was around 19 20 at that time and um i did that for a year and it was it was really good really exciting and and um I, I really enjoyed my time there going on for another year was a little bit kind of like daunting and I didn't want to do it, but I kind of got, you know, pushed into it to a degree in, in a positive way. Um, from my parents, you know, in terms of some income and a job and, and trying to hold something, but I was really, really hungry to get out and do something new and fresh and live. And, um, you know, that was not groundhog day like theater was same shows same thing you're working eight shows a week um so that was quite intense but i really wanted to get with my peers you know my my, my younger friends and peers who um who are starting to play now and starting to play in clubs and i was you know in contact with them and things like that so um when i left that um i actually got thrown out of that actually i think i got sacked <laughs> and i was trying to figure out a way because i was under contract so i was trying to figure out a way how to get out and I think, you know, being <laughs> the fifties, you had to have a quiff, you know, you had to have uh, long hair and make it into a quiff. So I just shaved my head one, one day, <laughs> <laughs> just rocked up and, and, um, and was, you know, really didn't want to be in the show anymore. We changed the DM of the show and I, we had a new DM. I really didn't like him. He was trying to change my style in the way I was playing and approaching the whole thing. I'd been in it for a year and everything was working fine. All of a sudden I was trying to be moulded into something I didn't want to be. So there was a bit of conflict there and I, you know, I ended up leaving, but, um, you knew it was the end subconsciously you just shaved your head because yes. you knew it was the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But just, just so, on yeah, that Lucia, so sorry. Fun. Um, I, I, I just wanted to comment on, um, you brought something up for me here around the performance and the, um, the piece, which is the, the, um, the theater piece. I got a small background 
in theatre as well. And I think it helped me immensely with how I interact with people, how I performed in when I when I speak uh, in in a, in, a, in a public speech. So you are obviously got the public performance part with your drumming. Did the, the theatre and acting part, did, did that sort of uh, help you along your way as well? Yeah, I think in some degree. Um, in some degree it did, for sure. Um, you know, to understand that you're, you're, you're putting on a, you're into, well, in, in a basic form, you know, it's entertainment. Um, so yeah, I, I could see how that was. You know, you you could you could bring a bit of that into into yourself if you were to get into certain situations in in front of the public or or, or whatever. But um, you know, for me, it was really you know just wanting to be who I was and 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 and, and act and be who I am, um, yeah. and not have to put on an act, so to speak. If I get in those situations, you know. But you're really acting, craving the live show after that. You really want to get into that yeah, live really show craving piece. that. Yeah. Yeah, but I also understood how, you know, being in a, in a theatre and in a show, how that can be, um, you know, the, the aspects of that can be can be really good for, for putting on a show, you know, whether it's even, you know, because, you, you know, to some degree you are entertaining in, in some way. Um, but obviously the, the, the music that I'm involved in now and I like to do is, you know, it's just a real, it's, it's really who you are as a musician. You're just on stage and you're just performing. So I really wanted to get into that environment. And... Um, that's when I joined um, Juice, a friend of mine's um, that were basically my first friends in life, really, when I was like two or three years of age. But um, they formed a band, Krishna and Amanath, um, both brothers, really talented players, fantastic players. And they had a band called Juice and they were playing around the, 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 the pubs and the clubs and the cafes and in Sydney. So when I left um, the Buddy Holly show, I joined that and that was interesting because i bounced out of playing like in this you know 50s music um into kind of more of this retro-y type of hendrixy zeppelin-y you know black sabbathy rocky bluesy pink floydy type of a sound you know um and that was you know that band actually ended up doing pretty good mm. um and you know we're actually still together now um a long time down the track you know but Back then, we got signed to Polydor, and um, we were doing major tours with, with like In Excess, and um, we even did some with Radiohead on their famous, you know, when their single blew up, Creep, and we did some shows with them, and we we played with the Hootie Gurus nationally, and um, the Tea Party, and a bunch of other bigger bands too. So um, we did we did quite well for like a good two and a half years, and. Um, you know, we were a young band being signed and, and that was really exciting at that, at that time and gave me a real good, um, you know, foundation in, in, in that level of, of the industry, I think. Um, it must have been a really playing, special time. Sorry, it must have been such yeah, a special well, time was, for you coming straight back in that live environment with the juice and having that success. It must yeah, have been a great feeling. It, yeah, it was because it was a little bit of like that back when I was younger, like ha having a real projection of what I really wanted to do. And never second guessing that and, you know, getting to that, you know, 21, 22 years of age. And then this starts to manifest and, and come about, which was really like, okay, this is, this is great. You know, these, these are the kind of aspirations that I had when I was younger and, and it's, and it's working, you know? Mm. Um, so yeah, that, that was the, that was a period in, in, um, you know, the, the journey musically there. And then from there, I kind of, chuffed off on into other paths and tried other you know did other bands and and all sorts of um you know whether it be some session work or or um you know just other local gigs it was just a real every you know thursday friday saturday sunday i had to be working playing drums in some sort some capacity somewhere and that means i you know i was trying to broaden my my relationships, musical relationships and in many respects and um, yeah, basically keep pursuing and, and, and walking down that path, you know, without having to have a so-called day job. Yeah. And was it something that you wrote down? Did you have like a, a plan in your head or was it something that you put on paper and you said, look, this is actually what I want to do, where I want to be. This is the kind of goals and aims I have. How did you approach that? It probably would have been good to have a bit more of that. I think <laughs> um, my, 
my intuition and, you know, um, just my heart and my intuition and my mind, you know, all said, just keep doing what you love to do and something will fall. Something will happen. Something, you know, and, and being all of not, you know, 49 now, it, it's, it's, that's still the case, you know, which is interesting. You know, it's like just when you think uh, something fall, something comes in, something from left field comes, comes in and, and gives you an opportunity to do something. Um, you know, a, a bit, a little bit more of a battle plan probably would have been good in terms of financially, I think, because as a musician, it's, you know, it depends on what level you get to and, and, and how it pans out, but it can be a pretty, you know, live by the sword, you know, paycheck to paycheck, gig to gig kind of way of life in terms of, you know, making making some money especially when you get a bit older obviously and you're starting to get more responsibilities and especially when you have family and things like that so um if you haven't been set up previously in in, in quite a good financial way it can become very challenging very very challenging mm -hmm. um you have to broaden you know i guess your um your scope in so many regards to well in different areas in the music industry what can i do and what can i serve and how can i you know how can I um, make a living, not just playing drums, but doing other things as well. So, um, but still under the umbrella of, of um, music, you know, um, which has always been very, very, very challenging. So um, um, I've, you know, I'm at that stage now. Um, if I look back, um, I've just, I've held the course, you know, and, and I've, yeah. I've, I've kept that course and for better or for worse it, it is what it is but um you know i wouldn't trade trade it for anything obviously especially all the experiences the great musicians i've worked with um the music i've made and all those type of things are just you know the value in all those things is 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 definitely more than you know money can buy as they say as cliche as that sounds but you know those experiences are you know what define i guess who you are to a degree yeah and I actually spoke to a, a guy yesterday, Alex Icon. He, he talks a lot about um, delivering value for others. But one thing I've heard you say a lot is, uh, you know, you, this, how can you serve? And I think leading with the heart, as you say, is such a genuine thing. And that's where you're leading with your sort of why and your purpose first and following that and, and the other aspects follow. And um, I mentioned this uh, sort of um, before, but, you know, I remember there was an interview you had with Andrew Hogue from Triple J and you, you sort of referred to the, the service of the drummer as sort of this beat shaman doctor and your role in society to serve. Can you tell us a bit more about what that means to you? Yeah, I, I mean, I use that, that, that term to a degree, but um, I guess it, it is a, when you, un, when, you, when you conceptually kind of look at, there's a lot of, well, supposedly what we understand to be quite a, quite a number of people on the, on the earth um not all of them are drummers and there's only a small amount really you know compared to the mass volume of of uh people but a lot of the people which is more than the drummers dance to music and the majority of people i like to think anyway love music so you know being being a drummer and being in that role is a really big service to humanity's happiness you know if you take away the music industry or the money or the or whatever you know if you're left with just like rhythm and and dance um that's such an uplifting thing that happens you know for people and the drummer provides that and the musicians provide that so and it can be a simple a simple beat like the first beat you ever learn you know um which i tell when i teach when i teach um some of my students and we, we we, we push everything away other than to play drums and have the relationship with drums and have that for the rest of your life as a state of healthy mind and being in all, in all aspects. Um, you know, that, that position of just even just playing that simple beat to whoever's there going to dance and listen, um, you know, can really do a lot. You don't have to, and it's great obviously to aspire and become really, really good at what you do and challenge yourself and get really you know get try and 
you know, as we like to quote it, be be one of the best you can be in the field that you you know that you, that you do. Um, even something simple like just playing, you know, jump and jack, blast. first beat you ever learn. Jump jack, flash, the gas, yeah, yeah. Hit it on a highway and playing rock and roll. I mean, that's the that's the first beat you learn, and these beats that are providing the, the the dance for hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah, you know, at, at one time, you know, and and that is such a great, um, you know, role to play as a human being in the, you know, the human family, if we like to call it that. Um, the grand scheme of things, I think, is just great, and you are type of like a a shaman beat doctor, if you will. And you, you provide that heartbeat, you provide mm -hmm. that rhythm, you provide that dance for, for people to feel good and work through their problems and work, for, you know, and, and, you know, um, be, a, be happy, you know, be sad, be all types of emotions. Um, but you, 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 the drummer's role there is quite profound, I think. And it has a lot of value, a lot yeah. of value. The drummer, the drummer, the, like I was going to say, you know, the heartbeat, your know, music's such a remedy and a medicine for so many people. And a big part of that, of course, is, is the beat. And um, a lot of people look to that to find sometimes make sense of things in life if they need to get away from something or if they need happiness or sadness. There's just so many different ways that it serves. Um, and that's uh, definitely true for me. And actually, again, I was speaking to Alex, the guest yesterday about this and you referred to that music part, music part being that medicine, that element that everyone needs. Really, it's such an important thing. Um, and definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were talking about a few of the bands you've been in. Um, you know, just to, to mention a few more, you've got the Hanging Tree, you've got Cog, Floating Me, The Nerve, amongst many others. I just really wanted to touch on the aspect we've kind of discussed a bit before, but these sort of big stage moments, you know, in front of thousands of people, um, you know, what, what's the feeling of that? How does that, how does that uh, unfold for you? Yeah, that's a, um, every environment is slightly different that you, that you play in and any musician will kind of tell you that if I'm playing in the live environment. So, you know, whether it is the 50,000 people kind of big, day out stages so to speak you know the bigger festivals or the you know 50 people in a smaller room um it, there's still kind of a level of of something that's quite intrinsically the same and i think that that is is that you you want to as a musician you you want to do the best you can do um in any given environment and and position so you'll you'll you know you'll you'll try and give 100 percent, and you'll you'll try and um with all the knowledge that you know and practice and everything that you've you've harnessed over the years you try to deliver that as best as you can and, and create an environment for people to to enjoy and um you know for me whether it's 50 people um or 50,000 people um it's 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 relatively in some regards the same you know um, because you're trying to deliver the same thing Mm -hmm. um the stakes can be a little higher in some re in some regards with, with some performances but sometimes i find the intimate ones are even more more you know because people are right there so it's yeah. you know the you're under the microscope so to speak in many respects uh, and then there's that real closeness too you know there's that the energy is really maybe not as as overtly powerful as fifty thousand people or whatever but still it's intense it can be very intense even with 50 to 20 people watching you know, yeah. because you know, you, you're in the, you're in a situation where it's live, you know, there's no second take, you know, there's no CGI editing, you know, it's, it's like live. Um, and that capacity is really powerful. And, and, and to a musician, it's really engaging and um, quite seductive in many ways because you, you, you want to try and be the best you can be. And some nights are, are, are not as good as other nights. Um, so you, you, you kind of go, well, there'll be, you know, wasn't the best night. And, you know, I'll, I'll try better on the next show. I've got another opportunity. If you're lucky enough to have an op another opportunity. So um, you're always trying to, well, I am anyway, as a musician, I'm always trying to see where I'm at, you know, in the live environment and, and my emotions and how I'm feeling and, 
um, and, and really trying to invoke those in my playing as best as I can and, 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 and just be really as true as I can to, um, you know, the instrument, what I know, um, how, how to play the instrument and um, deliver the most honest and um, performance I can. And um, yeah, when you have a good gig and any musician will tell you, it, it's, it's, um, you know, it's such a great feeling, especially when you're with musicians who have also had a great gig and you've, you've, you know, together, you've, you've, you've reached some type of a, a, um, you know, top of the hill, so to speak, you know, some gigs don't, you know, not everyone's on the same page for whatever reason, you know, and it's quite, that's what's quite interesting about live music. And that's why live music is so important that we have that experience, um, not just virtually, which kind of, you know, can be one dynamic, but really, you know, you, you don't, and I've, I've heard this said before, but you don't, you know, get to understand the, the incredible, capacity of the Grand Canyon by looking at a postcard you know you've mm. got to go to there and stand there and, and take it in yeah in real, really good, in real yeah in real time in real life you know so you know the, the live environment is um is where it's at for me in, in in so many respects and you know being like this interview now obviously is in this um this lockdown period of not being able to play live um is an interesting place to be, you know, it's a really, it's a very strange place to be, not to be able to go and go somewhere and, and provide music and, and um, you know, make people dance, forget about their worries that they've gone through through the week and the weekends are time to kind of, just kind of chill out and dance and, and, and have fun and and not to be, being able to provide that right now is, is really, is, is, um, you know, it really, hits you hard i think and a lot of musicians will tell you that and i understand a lot of musicians are moving towards live streaming and things like that but i you know in some respects you know to me that's just um it's not where it's at at all uh, you know i can see some of the logical aspects of it but um you know we want to get back to playing in the live environment you know yeah. and that that's that's where it really happens you know i couldn't think of anything worse actually than you know kind of being so separated from people that I have to set up in a room and through technology have to film it and try and put on a performance. Like I, it just, it almost, you know, just, yeah. I don't know, in my yeah. nature, it just, just doesn't feel right at all. You know? I'm, I'm, so, I'm with you. I'm with you on that one, Lucius. I think there's a few points you bring up here that really um, are great. I think the first one is, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to be a punter at a few of your gigs. Some I can remember better than others <laughs> for particular alcohol related reasons. But um, it, you know, I've, I've been to the smaller venues and I've been to you know, the larger venues as well. And you're right, like there's something about the intimacy of the venue and there's something that's unbeatable in being able to, you produce the, the, the experience and then the, the punter being able to consume the experience all at once. Now, it's something that is just undeniably brilliant and I've, I've always been someone that's struggled with people that stick their phones or recording devices up during the whole thing i really struggle with that but now we're yeah, you're bringing up this aspect of, yeah you bring up this aspect of the live streaming stuff which i uh, i am aware of um uh, some uh, the, some fans asking you guys to to do that and i know yeah. how much you guys pride yourselves on the the live experience and it's really what where where you guys other than the studio which is amazing your live experience produce is amazing and I, it's i'm with you on that you know i've seen a few artists that are doing it and I, I get the concept and the idea but nothing can beat that real visceral environment being there with other people beside you enjoying it yeah i think we have to be really careful as a mu musical community that we you know we don't fall into this that capacity and that's all it becomes mm -hmm. you know and, and i think a lot of people are feeling that well it's going to go back to normal so it's okay just to do a few but you don't know that and you're not working yet and you're not back in the live environment and you've got no idea how it's going to look yeah. after something like this has happened. Yeah. So it's almost, you know, <laughs> in our best interest to almost in some type of a funny way, like a, a protest where we don't do anything at all on any of these mediums, because we want everyone to be back into the place where it happens 
for real and vibrationally where that element of um, energy together really, really gives us a, a sense of purpose in life. And, and, and it, it's so important. You don't get that from even, you know, watching a gig on the, you know, someone's filmed it on the television or, a, you know, or on a live stream or anything like that. I mean, we've live stream at shows for a, for a short period of time. Here's a song. Here's like, you know, this is what you're missing out on. If you haven't come to yeah. the show, check this out. That's that, you know, you can use these tools for that capacity, but I think we've got to be really careful about, you know, over, uh, uh, you know, being desperate, you know, to some degree, because, um, I want us all back to work, you know, yeah. in, in a way where we feel good about ourselves and, the, and, and obviously the people who love to come and see music and together collectively, that's where the energy happens. That's where the, we exchange ideas. That's where, you know, um, you know, we can really unify and, and, and collectively be together, you know, on so, and to not have that um, is really strange. And I get why to some degree, but it, it obviously, and you know, you don't want to, discredit um things that have happened in terms of people's lives and, and and things that have um you know happened in terms of you know this virus yeah their that, livelihoods that's, that's been, yeah that that's you know but um you know you can't deny some of that stuff obviously um but there's a time and a place where it, it goes on for too long you know and the capacity on the flip side of of the just you know the devastation of what this could cause in many other aspects is is phenomenal it's huge um and is really concerning so i mean but you know just sticking to the to the live stream thing yeah i i, I kind of did because i got asked by family and friends and some you know um you know fans of, of the band and i had conversation with musical friends and suggesting why don't you do live streaming you know why don't you you do it and and I just simply said, I'm not interested, you know, in the sense that I've been working in the live environment since I was 13. Mm -hmm. And I know how and I've, I've played in so many gigs. I've played, I've practiced for hours and hours to not sit in a room to play to people through, you know, the means of technology. I practiced in a room with no one there for years and years and years and years to get out of the room, to yeah. get into the live environment, to play for people. And, um, you know, the, that live streaming just doesn't cut it for me at all. And, and I think that, um, you know, there's lots of people that can disagree and, and will disagree. And, but I think maybe just have a think about what I'm saying there, you know, and, and, and what's important on, on other levels, you know, and um yeah I, I i i kind of said no to it and then i copped quite a bit of flack <laughs> quite a bit i got actually you know um, an official complaint <laughs> yeah there was there was lots of you know and I, it was funny because the, the the person who i was dealing with in terms of the conversation a fan of ours we'd had quite a relationship in the past and um you know i reached out to him many times and he, you know, got him backstage to some cog gigs and, you know, sent messages to when he was going through his really, you know, tough health times and, and things he had going on. He, you know, he was unfortunate about what happened to him. It was terrible trying to send him, you know, uplifting messages. And, and so we'd have conversations back and forth for, for quite some time. And, and when I answered him back, it was, as you do in kind of chats and things, it was quite, Bit of quick banter. And quite a, yeah, quite a quick response as you do. Yeah, but people, but people obviously didn't know that. And when we put, when we posted it, and he said it was okay to post, but when I posted it, a lot of people looked at that as like I was a very dismissive, um, rude type of a person, you know. Not, and they didn't, you know, they didn't know, unfortunately, that I actually had quite a few dealings with him in many capacities. So I could see how wow, you know, that it really set off a bit of a. A bit of a but it, you know i'm glad that it kind of happened in a way too because it was it was good to have um kind of some respect draw that line you know for 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 myself you know like mm -hmm. where i'm i'm not going to be that type of guy that sits in a room and and tries to play drums through technologies and and yeah i i, I want um 
I want the real life. I want the, the, the real relationship. I want the, the real energy that happens, you know, in those capacities. Um, because I know how not only does it, has it helped me through my life, um, you know, whenever I've struggled, um, but it helps other people too. And, you know, obviously using these technology devices and tools can be great in so many respects. I get that. And I do it too. And I use them as well. Um, but, um, you know, that's that, that one for me is, is, has to be, you know, has to be really integral. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, very, special and, place. Yeah. it's, a, very, it's it is, a very special place. It's a very it's, special place, live environment. It's, it's the sacred space. And I do understand where you're coming that's from. The word. That's the word. That's the word. <laughs> yeah, it is. And I know how much that means to you. And I think when people think about, you know, oh, I'd love, I want to go see music in a gig soon. They're probably not really thinking actually on the other flip side of that is what's happening to the artists and the industry at the moment and how they're going through this as well. And it's not only just the artists and I don't want to take it away from what's happening to the, the artists, but also the whole crew behind them as well, which I know we were discussing Absolutely. before, you know, the roadies all the way through to the, the management and all the teams. What's been yeah, your experience? That, 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 that's yeah, it's been it's it's terrible. I mean, never in the history of mankind as as um, healthy people being quarantined and locked up. And you know, as soon as this happened, you know, red flags went up straight away for me. So I, you know, dived in, you know, as deep as I could to try and understand what was going on and understand um, what we were dealing with. And that's why on my socials i kind of you know started posting you know lots of things to do with doctors that aren't getting you know mainstream attention or they're, they're getting censored or you know these type of things i really pushed on all my social pages certain things that i'd come across that were contradicting certain aspects of coming through the mainstream media because i want to get back to work i want us to get back into the live environment so i want to hear as much you know responses as I can from you know professional doctors and 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 so to speak so the ones I came across and the, the you know and I started posting and all the rest of it were, were giving me an indication that okay we can go back to work now you know this is not as 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 full on as you know people aren't just dying in the streets everywhere you know what I'm saying it's like you know there's an elderly population who have pre-existing you know conditions that are more vulnerable to it um but shutting down the whole economy um, the projections were wrong in terms of like the, you know, what they were forecasting was going to happen. The models that were coming from the, the governments and things, they're completely wrong. It didn't happen at all. Um, but stuff got shut down. So, you know, my best, you know, um, what would you call it? R response in some way would be to try and get as much information as I could put it into my communities, social communities, especially when it's coming from, you know, doctors, as I said, um, which is basically all I was posting um, and what they were saying. And that was giving me the indication a hundred percent that, you know, we should be going back to work now, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, is, there, is there light at the end of the tunnel at the moment? Do you see, what do you see happening next? Uh, with this, well, I still, I still, there's still no real finish line. I mean, some of the clubs and pubs are opening back up to a degree, but they can only have a certain amount of, you know, people, which is not, there's no point in them opening up because they can't pay for, you know, the expenses they've got to pay for. If they can only have, say, 50 people in a mm. 500 capacity room that has, you know, thousands of people coming through it, mm. whether that's the pub or the club. So, yeah, I, I don't know what it looks like yet. No idea. You know, it's frustrating. So, yeah, it's a really, so, so, you know, all I can really do is, is um, you know, get busy in the studio here and produce and play and, and write music and, and do as much as I can in this capacity for now. Yeah, and it's great you've got the studio. I, I want to touch on that because um, I've, I've not visited, but I've seen it obviously online. Um, 101 Studios, which is a studio out there in Byron. Uh, it looks great, by the way. Um, you obviously sit in front of your wonderful drum kit there. Uh, tell us a bit about this, how the studio came about. Oh, there's, there's the love of your life. <laughs> One of my loves of my life, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, surely, <laughs> I surely won't be asking uh, for a, a drum solo, especially after what we've just discussed. So <laughs> that's maybe for another day. <laughs> maybe for another day. Um, yeah, it's um, basically I've, I've always wanted to get into, into the production of 
music and, and recording and production. So it's because it's always obviously a big part of it, being a musician going in and recording and, and having that relationship with um, making music as well. Uh, so with COG, um, when it took a hiatus for that time, um, I kind of jumped into it and I had the opportunity to take over a studio. Um, it wasn't really a, a professional recording studio, but I kind of ended up, you know, making it into that. It was a really good space. And I kind of jumped into that and I, I, I thought, well, I, now it's now or never in, in a sense, you know, like I've, I've accumulated a lot, a lot of knowledge. I understand I've been in many studios. I've got, I've got some feel for it. I've got an idea how to do some things. So I kind of um, ventured off down into, you know, just starting a real small production kind of studio that was demoing bands and, you know, bands were coming in when I took over this kind of studio space. They were, uh, you know, practicing and, and coming up with ideas and I was recording. I was also teaching out of there as well out of the studios. And I was in Sydney. I called that one Key Sound Studios. And I had that for three years and my production got bigger and bigger and the, I got more equipment. And as more bands started to come in and I started to record them and uh, started producing them and, you know, just really spending a lot of time understanding how to, um, you know, record and engineer and, and produce music even more, which was, which was so good. It was really, really great and a place I've always wanted to, to, to be. So, um, but having that, um, the, the, the market and the real estate market was doing what it was doing uh, the people who I was renting off, they wanted to kind of like double the rent and things like that. So I couldn't, I couldn't afford the rent. So I had to basically close down. So for a few years there, I, I was really, you know, frustrated trying to find other spaces. I was working out of some studios, engineering and, and, and producing and recording some bands and, you know, trying to keep that alive as best as I can as doing live work and teaching and things like that. Um, and then when, when COG, um, we decided to kind of put on some shows and, and, and get back together again and play some more. The opportunity to move out of Sydney and um, move north to, to Byron, which is kind of like around this area where I've always wanted to kind of come. Um, this great place came up, which is, it's basically, you know, this is basically like a double car garage really, which I've, I've turned into a studio and there's a, a granny flat out the back, which is the control room and, and has the desk and everything and all the gear. And um, so we've been here like three years now and we've done a lot of the COG, new COG um, songs out of here. Um, and it's, it's working real, a real treat. We had, um, I had Andrew um, from Wolf Mother in here and Cram from Spiderbait, they came down and I've had some bands from, from Newcastle and um, Anna Marta and, and Rhino from, from Brisbane and some other artists as well. And um, you know, whether I'm doing sessions out of here for other people uh, playing on their stuff or um, producing it. Uh, other bands have just um, gotten to a point now where it's starting to, you know, get a bit of momentum. So it's taken a little bit of time, but um, it's it's a wonderful space and it's it's definitely the, uh, you know, the musical man cave, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, I spend a lot of time a lot of time in here, and and it's um, yeah, it's 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 um, part of that kind of like, if we go back to when I was thirteen or fourteen, and and really wanting to manifest what I wanted, um, you know, this has transpired. Um, so that's, you know, a, a good outcome. Yeah. So you've set that intention from a young age and that's like what is literally behind you is the manifestation of that. And it's a, it's a, it's a great thing to see. Um, I just want to also touch on cog as well. Uh, you know, I sure. think you guys, um, have had the hiatus like you mentioned. Um, and I've been aware that you've been doing some recording, uh, for any any of the fans out there, uh, is there anything coming up? You know, you've re released a couple of singles. Is there any albums or anything in the, the, the pipeline coming up? Well, the intention was to kind of write an album. We had a bit of a chat about that uh, last year or the end of last year. And um, we kind of set a little bit of a path there and and, and a bit of a compass to, to, to make an album, to make a, you know, a third, well, well, it would be our fourth album. Um, if you include Just Visiting as the first album, they were two EPs, but you know, it was meant to be an album. Um, so the intention was to, to write an album and, and we started to get to work on that. And then all this, you know, coronavirus stuff happened. So 
everyone kind of, you know, kind of went there, has gone their separate ways for the moment, just kind of tending to what they've got to tend to and, um, and all the rest of it. So that's slowed things down a lot. We were working on a song, um, which we have, which we haven't, you know, we haven't released yet or anything like that. So we still got to keep working on that, but there's plenty of parts and there's plenty of bits and, you know, we sat in here and we, we, we download a lot of ideas that we had from, you know, from our iPhones, our, our voice memos and, you know, whether they're riffs or beats or vocal things, you know, we put them all into the, into the pro tools and then we sit down and we kind of listen to what we think's good. Cause that could be like a bit of a catalyst to create a song from. And we, you know, we kind of came up with a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff sitting there. So, so that's good. It's just, it's just the, um, trying to find the time and, and to, to make it happen, which is challenging because obviously we're, we're independent band and, and, um, we finance ourselves. So not only do we have to finance our, our, um, our, our group, our band, our business, but, um, also our families obviously and independently and stuff like that. So, and we're all fathers now we all have, you know, we've, we've, we've got those responsibilities as well. So it's a, um, it's a challenging time to try and find those times to, um, be creative with the, with the music. Um, and it's, it can be frustrating, um, in, in many respects. And obviously for the fans as well, things just seem to take a lot longer. I mean, if we, if we had a, a big budget, obviously, and we had, you know, the money flow like a, a record company would give you, which we had in the past for the last two albums, um, which, you know, help us get into a place where we didn't have to worry about kind of day jobs or anything like that. We could really sit and we could really just focus on the music and we could pay for what we needed to pay for and get things out quicker than, um, quicker than kind of like what we're doing now. But, um, you know, I guess that's the bit of the trade off of wanting to be independent in so many respects. And not that we, we weren't, we, we had a great deal when we had the, the record company, but um, that was only for a couple of albums and the, the record company is now, has kind of folded anyway as, as a company. So um, we're kind of, you know, we're on our own. So um, it's a, it's a good, it's a good time in that, in that regard. So we can take, you know, and we have the studio so we can really cultivate and make a lot of music is just trying to find the time to, to do that. And that's, that's really challenging. Hopefully people will be patient. You know, we, we really still love working together. We still love musically working together. Um, you know, we, we find a lot in common musically with, 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 you know, how we like to feel and, and, and uh, vibe on music. And, um, you know, that's, that's a really good thing. And we're quite eclectic with our, our style of music. So that's a good thing too. Um, and we're still catering to that. We're still trying to find new sounds and interesting sounds, not only for, for ourselves, but for people who like our music. We don't want to repeat ourselves in some regards. Um, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but we, you know, we really want to make a good song, a good song and a good cog song. So, um, you know, hopefully there'll be a time where, you know, it's, I always say where there's a will, there's a way. And, you know, um, we've just got to try and, find that time you know which is which is challenging yeah but i'm always i'm always pushing for it and i'm always trying to you know get the guys to to come in and and um you know start writing and you know i can sound a bit boring sometimes but you know <laughs> crack, crack the whip I, kind of yeah i yeah I've, I've learned not to crack the whip too much because <laughs> yeah. last time i did that we went into hiatus <laughs> okay um, <laughs> yeah don't do too much then yeah just enough so, yeah so i really want to play music i really want to write music um yeah like you know it's there's 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 a couple of things that happen you know because i i i kind of fall in into the into the um into the path of like music is what provides my income and my livelihood and and i want to keep it like that and I like that because that's what I like to do. And, and, it, and it gives me a good reason to get up in the day and, and, and feel alive and, and creative. And, and, you know, it's such a, it's such a, um, you know, if you can get the opportunity to have that, which in some respects I've, I, I have had, um, when, you know, especially if Cog's been doing, going through a good spell, um, uh, it, it's, it, 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 I've never wanted to do anything else. So, 
you know, but the other guys have got other ideas about what they want to do with their lives and, and their working lives. So there's always a challenge there of trying to, you know, make them, you know, kind of come together if you, if you will, you know? Um, so I have to be, I have to be very patient in some mm. regards. Yeah. There's, um, with, with, with the new challenges in life, there's new, new skill sets coming <laughs> potentially. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, so, think... I mean, I'm still, I'm still recording with, with, with juice too. We're recording a fourth album now, which cool. is great. And, great. And I mean, you know, a lot of these things for me are just it's camaraderie, you know, it's, it comes down to, I love my friendships. I love my friendships with my friends. And, and I think, you know, being able to play music together collectively, um, and come up with stuff is, 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 is so much fun. And, yeah. um, and that's, it's a good, it's a good excuse to, to kind of, you know, hassle my friends and say, Hey, what's happening in your life? Let's get together. Let's write a song. Let's that, you know? Um, so, you know, like with, with juice, you know, we're, as I said, we're, we're doing a fourth album. We're remixing an, an old album that we did years ago, um, that we didn't quite like the production of. So we're, you know, we've got the, the tools and the, the, the desire and the space to do that now. So we can remix an old album that we, we, we put out, but put new and fresh ideas into it and look at it in a new light. So that's really fun and exciting at the moment, really liking that. And it's going to come out really great. And the new album there, which will be fun. And these guys I've known since I was two or three. So we can, you know, keep the relationship up and, um, you know, have an excuse to, to have one too, you know, everyone else's fathers, the other guys live in, in Sydney. Um, but it's a really great way to connect, you know, yeah. in so many respects. So and it's great. You, know, you can bring it back to your why as well. You know, you, uh, every time you, you mention these things, you always bring it back to, this is actually what I want to get out of it. You know, we're doing these good things, but I get, get to hang out with my mates and, you know, have some great camaraderie and fun at, at, during the meantime, which is what it's all about. Yeah. Working to working together, exploring together, you know, creating, creating together using the imagination you know um it's it's, it's it's great fun you know it's really really great fun well uh to juice and cog fans i'm sure there's many many people waiting with bated breath uh watch this space <laughs> very exciting yeah. and then I'll, I'll just rewind it uh you know we're talking we've just talked about the fact that you know it's been really difficult and there's been no touring that's been able to be done at the moment but you got the opportunity last year and the year before i think it was and um, you went to europe you did a Europe tour and um, you were yeah. able to get out here to London. I, I was able to see you then as well, which was great. I said, thanks for coming to see me. <laughs> yeah, it was a good, good, good show, that one. That was a really good show, one of my favourites. Yeah. What did getting back out on the road do for you? Well, going over there was something we've always wanted to do. Um, it's been very challenging, obviously, financially to, to try and get over to, to Europe, over to that place and, you know, visit and play and and for the, the the 14 days that we were i think it was 14 or 17 days when we committed to do it um we were like we just went for it you know we hardly slept we were on a bus we were if we weren't playing or gigging we were walking around seeing whatever we could see and you know we were exhausted by the end of it but it was like absolutely such a great experience and and we, we'd always wanted to do it and there was you know people that have been hanging to see us for so long and and it, so it was you know there was great connections there and we went with a band called uh, sleep makes waves so that helped keep the budget down a little bit and also added a bit of that um value to the to the to the tour as well mm -hmm. they've been there a few times and um so it was yeah it was really eye-opening and it was it was just in all respects a great experience and um you know just really it kind of you know put us back in a little bit of that um you know when we were touring with cog you know say in the in the early days of of um the new normal and things like that where it was it was you know to some degree it was just very intense and it was every you know every step of the way it was just music 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 um but we we had a great time really really good time so many good memories from that and um yeah we're so glad we did it you know we hope to do it again sometime if we can i mean if you can if you can travel <laughs> yeah here's to hoping <laughs> and there you have it the first part of two i hope you got something out of it like i did now if you have any questions feedback or want to jump on the podcast feel free to email me at the blueprint at gmail.com i'm also all over socials at the feelgoodblueprint thanks so much <laughs>